Okay, uh, we're going to start. Was the lunch as delicious for you as it was for me? Good. Uh, my name is Ridwan Vasilin, and it is my pleasure to uh, be speaking here for the first time at LinuxConf in South Africa. And um, I am, as you can see from my email address, I'm from Microsoft, and uh, I do various things there. But today, I, it's my pleasure to talk to you about moving from VMs to containers to Kubernetes. Now, who here has been playing around with Docker containers? Okay, not all of us, okay. And Kubernetes? Okay, think, great, you're in the right place. And for those of you who are Jedis at Kubernetes, this is probably an introductory talk for you, um, but perhaps you could use it as a way to explain and introduce others uh, to this concept. And so it's an introductory talk, and I'm going to start off with this picture. It's uh, actually a piece of art created by an architect called Jean Novel, a very French architect, and it's called the monolith. It is a monolith. It is in the middle of a lake somewhere in Europe, and uh, there's a whole bunch of art inside of it. To get to it, you need to take a boat, and it presents an interesting challenge uh, because it's, a mon uh, it's kind of a, a representation of how we've been coding and how we, we have been building applications, uh, so-called monoliths. Now, there's nothing wrong with this. Uh, we, we see monoliths coming back with a vengeance, and, um, and, and that's quite cool. But if you think about changing the plumbing in a thing like this, wouldn't really be fun, would it? Because you'd need to get there with a boat. And so Jean Novel actually says that for every situation or, 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 or new situation, there's a new architecture. And the situation that we found ourselves in creating monoliths was a new situation, right? And, and that's cool. But in today's fast-moving world, uh, where change is an absolute constant, and uh, we need to get things done very, very quickly, Architectures look a little bit like this. It's not, a, it's not stationary, it's a ship, it's moving around, and there's a bunch of containers on the back of it, and if you want to change anything, we could kind of move containers around and, and, and replace them. Uh, we're not saying that this is the ultimate architecture, but it is something that we are dealing with uh, at the moment in terms of where we are in our situation. Uh, and so it's always interesting maybe to take uh, these situations that we found ourselves in, and it's a great learning experience to understand where were we, what challenges did we experience, what did we invent as an industry to overcome those challenges, and then, um, you know, what were the next challenge and the next challenge. So I'm going to go through a little bit of a history lesson around where things are and how did we get to this thing called Kubernetes and, and containers. Okay? Good? Cool. Let's get physical. So back in the day, we'd be racking and stacking v, um, v, um, physical machines, and uh, we'd put an operating system, system on it, of course Linux, and we'd put various dependencies and libraries and things like that to run our application. Now, it's not as easy as, um, of course, uh, many of you would know, as the puzzle pieces there, which kind of, it's so easy just to slot it in because it sometimes isn't that easy. Because if you've got multiple applications on the same physical machine, invariably there'll be conflicts and things like that. Libraries don't work or, you know, different versions of, of, of runtimes and things like that, right? And so what we do to isolate these, we get another machine and we put it on there. And so the isolation that we needed and the challenge that we've, we found ourselves in is put new machines in there. And those machines became increasingly cheap, but there's wastage there. And so, hello virtualization. Virtualization is a great technology because we could take that very same hardware that we have and put these virtual machines inside of it. And so we could spin up these virtual machines, and if you cracked open one of these virtual machines, it would look like a physical machine. And so uh, inside the virtual machine, we could install our Linux operating system, uh, dependencies and the applications, and we could have multiple virtual machines on this physical hardware. Fantastic. It's all great. 
uh, but it's not as efficient as it could, could be. Why? Because we found that actually if we look at this virtual machine and you see what's duplicated there, we've got a duplicate operating system. And if we're using the same application dependencies or something similar, um, it's a duplication as well. And so, wow, we invented something new. And we invented, here comes containers. And containers were awesome because uh, we could, on the same hardware, have an OS and put this little thing called Docker, the Docker engine, which is widely popular, and we could have a, bu a bunch of the dependencies running on that Docker engine with containers. If we cracked open one of these containers, it will actually have the application dependencies there as well as just the, uh, you know, the actual application as well. And so our dependencies are shared across our containers, which is a much more efficient. And so we get this, this amazing uh, density of applications to physical hardware. And so the container advantage um, is that we can take our containers and put them on even VMs, on these physical hardware, okay, uh, and decommission a whole bunch of the VMs that we don't need or that, that, and free up resources. So containers become incredibly uh, amazing because we could literally containerize our applications and move them to other VMs uh, and, and move them literally to any way we want to, physical machines, VMs, uh, in the cloud and so on, and it would just kind of work. Why? Because it has all it needs inside of that container and nothing is duplicated. The operating system isn't duplicated, the kernel is used, using the host OS kernel, um, and, and, and if there are dependencies, it would be you know, uh, shared across the containers, which is absolutely amazing. But we have ran into issues with containers. As you move into containers, you have lots of issues around um, herding this cattle. Uh, because if you run, if you think about running hundreds of containers all over the place, it runs into, you, you run into issues that we need to solve, like scheduling containers, monitoring the health, um, the networking of that containers, uh, what happens with failover and discovery and, and healing and things like that. And so this widely popular project called Kubernetes um, came about like wildfire and solved a whole bunch of these problems with containers. And so we see Kubernetes skills actually being in the top 15 skills that you as an engineer can have. And so uh, you see this increased popularity, but a lot of people here in our country still, you know, interested in, okay, what is this thing? Literally what it's doing is it's solving all of these problems for us. And that's really great to talk about and I could do more whiteboards and things like that, but it would be better to show you um, how this all works, right? Who agrees with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah everybody agrees, of course. Um, so I'm going to demo uh, some stuff for you, and hopefully it will take you from perhaps what you know right now to what, you know, Kubernetes is all about, okay? Now I'm going to explain to you my demo environment. My demo environment looks like this. I've got my... Uh, desktop here, it's running Windows 10, but I'm running the Ubuntu Bash shell on it, and you'll see me running it on, on there. And I'm SSHing into uh, two VMs, my dev box, uh, which is that jump box, and my Docker VM, which is, uh, you'll see that later on. But most of the work is going to be done on my dev box, and that can connect to my Kubernetes cluster, which I've already spun up in the cloud, and uh, it's all cool, I'll be using that. So just so that you understand, there's the environments, because it can get a bit uh, interesting. So here I am um, on my machine, and uh, can everybody see that? Yeah? Uh, so I have for you an application. Um, uh, it, it's, a, it's called helloapp.py. Uh, any guesses on what kind of application it is? <laughs> it's a Python application. and. Um, it does something uh, interesting. I'm going to show you. I'm going to launch my IDE and uh, to show you my awesome code. My IDE is that. Okay, it doesn't have any autocomplete, but it's uh, pretty fast. Uh, and so, yeah, it's a Python Flask application. Now, if you're not into programming, it's okay. I'll explain to you what's happening. Uh, it's using Flask. It's doing a whole bunch of things with colors. Uh, basically, it accepts a color via the command line or via a um, environment variable. Um, and if you don't choose a color, it will choose one for you. 
And uh, all it really does is it renders an HTML page and um, says hello from the host that it's running on. Okay, so it's pretty simple. And it does some other fancy things like it can accept input. And all it does with that input is just puts it out to a log file. This data log.out, we'll see that later on. And that's pretty much it, a very simple Python application. Um, so I'm going to quit that, right? So to run my application, I would, on my VM here, um, we're not talking about physical machine, we're way beyond that. We're going to just run Python. I've already got Python installed here, hello app.py. And there we go. So it says here, it's choosing a random color green, and it's, it's, it's listening in, in this VM. So I can go to my browser and go and find that VM, and it should give me, see, it worked. Of course it worked. It's a demo, right? Um, if this was real, it probably wouldn't. <laughs> so, so here we have um, the green hello from, notice the machine name, right? It's the host that we're currently running on. Uh, and that's quite cool, that's uh, fine. Gonna, I'm gonna cancel that, and I'm just going to do some housekeeping. I'm gonna create a Docker file or Docker image from this uh, application. So I'm just gonna delete this uh, log directory, because I don't need it. And I have a Docker file here. It's always been here, it's just hidden. So yeah, I have now this thing called a Docker file. So those of you who know Docker, uh, it basically defines how the Docker container is gonna be built, okay? Uh, so to have a look at what it is and what's inside of it, I'm gonna go into uh, the Docker file. And so it's defining a bunch of things here. Uh, the stuff with the hash is, is of course comments. It's saying from Python 3.6 Alpine. This is basically a small slither of Linux, and uh, it's already got Python installed. Okay, so that's the base of this Docker image. Uh, that's who created the, the Docker file, and it's saying run and, and install the Flask library, and it's saying copy everything that's in this directory into the directory in the image into web app, make that web app the working directory, expose port 8080, which is the default port that Flask uses, and when this container comes up, it's supposed to execute Python hello app.py, exactly what we just did right now, okay? Sounds good? We're all with us. So I'm gonna quit this. So now I wanna build a Docker container with this Docker file. So of course I would need Docker, <laughs> so I'm gonna say, it, say Docker, and I wanna build a container. So what do you think it's gonna, what do I need? What will be, come on, it will be Bold, right? So, so we're gonna build, docker build. We have to give the um, image a name, so we're gonna say tag it as, I'm just gonna call it hello v1, okay? And the docker file is in my directory right here, and I'm gonna execute that. So now docker is going out, and it's saying, okay, execute the first command. It says from Python uh, 3.6 Alpine. It doesn't have it locally, so it's gonna copy it down from the internet. It's pulling it down. And then it's gonna execute everything else. Do you remember what was the next command? It was uh, install the, the Flask library, which is gonna do not right now. It's gonna say copy all of the files in my directory into the directory called web app, make that the current directory, and um, expose the port, and uh, fix the entry point. Sounds pretty simple enough. So if I go here, uh, Docker images now, I wanna find out all the Docker images on this machine, it will show me Docker uh, it's got hello v1, and it's got Python Alpine, which is now cached locally on my machine. I, I think we need to do this again, just so that we get it again, right? So, so I'm gonna create a little change, and I'm gonna create a version two of my application, okay? So I'm gonna say, uh, I'm gonna modify something here. I'll do uh, templates, this HTML file. So instead of saying hello from, the specific host, I'm gonna say hello v2. Okay, so we're making a small change. And uh, now we're gonna build the image again, but this time we'll say it's version two. Okay, so what we need to do, can you remember docker, build, tag it as hello v2, okay? Docker file is right here. 
So see how quickly that happened now? It's already got that Alpine image. It's got a whole bunch of things already done. And it's just got a one small little thing that has got to change. And, uh, and, 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 and so this is a, an example of how Docker shares the resources um, um, across uh, you know, different containers. So we've got that there. And so if I go again, Docker images, so we'll have those two. Wow, accomplished a lot today. Um, so if I want to run this image, uh, let's say we run hello v1. If I wanted to run it, but often you need to say Docker, and then I would have to say run, right? <laughs> so Docker run, I can do that. Docker run, and um, the image name is hello v1. Now that's not going to work. It'll work, but it's not really going to work. Why? You didn't expect a quiz, did you? It's, it's because, remember the port? Port 8080. 8080. Boom. Oh, it's selected blue this time. You see the random color, blue. So if I go back to my uh, browser and I just refresh this, it's got blue. You see what happened here? Hello from this funny host name. It's actually created a host name for us automatically uh, as part of Docker. And so uh, if I go back here, and I, I can actually remote into this, this Docker uh, uh, machine that's running and, and actually show you that it thinks it's on a VM. You want to see that? Okay. So if I go split the screen and I go back into my, uh, my, my, my Jumpbox VM. So you can see I've got Jumpbox there and I've got Jumpbox there, right? So I'm in the same machine. Now I want to see what Docker images are are running at the moment, so it's actually executing. What would I say? I would say Docker, of course. Um, and then what would you do in Linux? You would say PS, right? You'd say PS. So I'll say PS, Docker PS, boom. OK, it's running. Hello v1, that's the entry point. It's given me a name here, Blissful Pain. <laughs> Interesting. I don't know if the demo gods are saying something to me, but anyway. Um, Blissful Pain. So I want to get into Blissful Pain. Okay. So uh, to do that, I have to say Docker. I can execute any command into a Docker container. I can say exec, and I can say give me an interactive terminal into Blissful Pain. And, I'm, uh, and to get the interactive terminal, I'll just say I want to execute the shell command. Okay. And be interactive with it. How beautiful is Linux? It's amazing. So I can do that, and it will give me a command prompt. So now I'm in web app, in that directory. That's the current, uh, that's the, the default directory, right? Uh, so I can go there. It's got my little stuff running. Um, I can go PS, that's inside the Docker container. It, it's, it's, it's Linux, right? And so I can actually, if I go back here and um, do something like this, say Linux conf is awesome. And I can say, dude, OK? So it's just logging this to that data log.io file. If I go back in here and I say cat uh, the data log.io file, it should give us those messages, right? There we go. So it actually thinks it's a VM, which is amazing. So it's everything that you know already is just wrapped up in a container. Now, if I... Uh, close this Docker file, and I stop it. Uh, what happens to my data log.out file? Is it still around? It's gone. It's temporal. It's uh, immutable. The container is immutable. Now, there's a whole other things that you will learn as you get into Docker and to Kubernetes around persistent volumes and lo loading all of that. But let's just park that for a second, right? Um, so here we have a container, it runs, it's all pretty cool, and I, and I can run it, I can do that. So let's say I wanted to now move this containers, Docker images, I wanted to move that to another virtual machine, which I have over here. Uh, no, not that. Yeah, sorry. 
I'm just uh, auto-typing there. So if I go, yeah, um, there's my other machine. That's, uh, you can see the prompt is different. It's a purple. So I've got here Docker installed. It's another VM, okay? I've got Docker installed there, and um, I have no images, okay? So let's say I wanted to get that Hello app into this machine, okay? Um, and uh, how would I do that? An easy way to do that is to use what we call a container registry. There's a Docker has a container registry, which is all public. You can sign up for it, and uh, you can explore a bunch of images that different vendors and people have created over time, uh, like MariaDB and things like that. We can just pull the container down into a machine. So what we can do with our application is we can actually publish that application into the Docker hub, which is called the Docker hub, and as a container registry. You can, of course, create your own registry, like in Azure, there's a private registry, like the Azure Container Registry, and all the clouds have one that's fully managed and so on. But we'll just use Docker Hub for now, okay? So to, to, to push this container up to the hub, to, to the Docker Container Registry, we can just go Docker. Um, we're gonna first uh, tag these images. Hello, V1, and we'll say, my account on Docker Hub is called Read1. Surprise, surprise. And it is, um, let's say, hello, tag it as hello v1. And we'll tag the other one as well, hello v2. Okay. So now I've tagged these images. And all it is is just a name, um, images. You can see, you can tag it as many times as you want. So you'll see uh, the same image is tagged uh, twice there. Okay. You can see the image ID is tagged twice. Um, the tag helps us and helps Docker understand where you want this image to be. So if I go, like in, if, if I wanted to push code with GitHub, um, or with Git up, up into the cloud, what would I use? I should git push, right? So I'll go Docker, push, hello, read one, hello. I'll just do hello because, well, um, it will do both of them. I'm not going to do this because I've tested the Wi-Fi here, and upload is download is very very strong and, and quick. But upload is not so good. Okay, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, I've already pushed it up there, and I'll show you where my registry is. If I go back here, um, I can go to Docker Hub. So I'm already logged in, and you see there, read one hello. And if I go into this registry here, it will give me that v1 and v2 is being uploaded. Why is it so slow? Okay, uh, V1 and V2 an hour ago. Okay, hey, it's for saving time. Okay, so here we are. So now I've got it up in my container registry. Again, it could be a private registry, but we're just using the public one here. So let's switch over to um, my Python VM that's empty. So here, if I want to run a Docker image, I can say Docker run, and I can say where, what image do you want to run? I want to run it off read one, um, hello, v1, okay? That's not going to work, why? I've told you before. The port, 8080, okay. It's not going to find the image locally, and guess what it's going to do? It's going to find it on Docker Hub, and it's going to pull it down, and then it will run it. And just like that, uh, it's pulled it down. Downloads very fast here in this, uh, but upload not good. Uh, and so it's, it will now run that Docker image. There we go. It's chosen a random color called green. Okay, so remember that. We'll go back here, and we'll go back there, and we'll say there. Cool. You can see it's running. It's not running from PyVM Py, Py 2019. It's running from the container. That was quick. That means I could literally take those containers that I've run, go to any other machine, and just say Docker run, bloof, it comes down. That quick, that awesome. Um, and so that's how you can use uh, pretty much Docker containers. So we're going to move ahead now because we mentioned that, um, uh, let's move it over to this one. We mentioned that 
as we increase the amount of containers, it becomes a bit of a challenge and we start introducing things like Kubernetes. Now, if you're running just Docker, like 4, 5, 10 Docker uh, containers on VMs, it's all cool. Um, and you could probably manage that. But as you get one container talking to another container and orchestration and things like that, it becomes a bit of a challenge. And that's how Kubernetes can help. So um, I'm going to go Kubernetes. Uh, uses this command called kubectl. And um, I'm going to say kubectl. Uh, get nodes. So I'm running three nodes of Kubernetes at the moment in Azure, in our local data centers here in South Africa. And uh, you'll normally, if you know Kubernetes, you can install them manually with VMs, and, and that's all cool and open, uh, but it can be a pain sometimes, so I'm just using the service. Uh, when you use the AKS service, the Azure Kubernetes service, it actually abstracts the master node, because there's no master node here. It should be four listed here. Uh, the master node is extracted, is handle, uh, handled by Microsoft, so you only pay, really, for the three nodes that you're running as compute. At the moment, I've got um, nothing running here, I can say kubectl, you've got this concept called pods, which is literally the smallest unit of compute inside of Kubernetes. It's kind of, think about it as a container with some wrapper around it, um, around uh, you know, things like desired state and all of that kind of stuff, right? And so I can say kubectl get pods, there's nothing happening. So let's say I wanted to run my Hello app here in Kubernetes. How would I do that? Well, I would... Um, say uh, kubectl create a deployment. A deployment is not a pod, it, it's made up of pods. And um, I'll say create deployment, let's call it hello app. And the image for this deployment is hello uh, v1. And so the deployment's been created. If I go and say kubectl get pods, comma deployments, I want to show you something. So, the deployment is something that we just created. The deployment has a desired state attached to it. It's like the amount of pods for the deployment that needs to run, um, you know, should it be auto-scaling, a whole bunch of other th things that it's attached to it. And the pod itself is just a little worker bee that's, that's running the actual app. Okay, so these two are linked. You can see it's given it a funny name here. Uh, remember that. Uh, so, 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 so that's pretty much the deployment. If I go uh, kubectl get pods, and I say output wide, it can give me the IP address for the pod. This is the actual container running here. Now you'll see it's not rootable, so we want to be able to root to it so that we can get to it from the outside of this cluster. And um, uh, to do that, I can do a quick way to do it is to expose the deployment. Now in this case, we're calling the, the, the name of this service a front end, and the port that we're going to exposing it to is 80, so we don't have to type in the port 8080, but the target port of the container is 8080. The type is load balancer. There's lots of different types you will learn. Don't worry about that too much. The moment, it's just going to expose this uh, Kubernetes pod to the outside world, this deployment to the outside world. A and if I go back to kubectl get services, uh, you'll see this front end that we try to create here, it's pending. It means it's still trying to get an IP address from the cloud, from Azure. Okay? But don't worry, I've saved us some time. I've created a backup one that already is attached to it. Okay? So I can go back here and say, okay, I want to attach that, I, that external IP address. If I copy that, and I put it in my yeah. See the name, the host name? It's dark blue. So, of course, obviously chosen something there. And um, not really any difference to Docker, right? The, the, the difference comes in is that, remember, Kubernetes has a whole bunch of other features that we attach to containers, like scaling, for example. If I go and I say, um, you know, uh, kubectl scale for me, give me three replicas of the deployment hello app. What would you expect to happen? 
will give me three copies of Allo app, right? So if I go again, kubectl get pods, comma deployments, it gives me three copies of Hello app. And if I go back here and I refresh, I should get three different hosts. Sorry. I should get three different hosts of Hello app. So some one red, one blue, one green. See? It's automatically scaled. Now that's, that, that, that becomes very interesting because we can do some, some, some interesting things with that um, just to show you um, uh, how really cool Kubernetes is. If I go here, uh, I have a little uh, URL test. I'll just show you what it does. It just does a call, and it gets just that little piece of, 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 of what the website pull, pulls out. So if I go, um, uh, what is it, URL test, and I put the IP address in, Everybody understand what's happening here? It's just pulling back the, what, the, what the Hello app says. Um, why I want to do this is because I want to show you something. If I go back here and I say, you see I've got three replicas? Uh, let's make them 13, okay? So I go 13, and you know what will happen on the right-hand side? It's, it's just going to increase the amount of pods. So if I go here, yeah, kubectl, get pods, you can see 13 of them running that quickly, all right? Uh, if I go back here, the user is going to just hit 13 different one of these, okay? Um, and that's, that's all interesting and cute, I think. Um, uh, but what if I want to now switch from Hello App, if I, if, if I what's running behind here is, um, if I edit the deployment, is actually a YAML files. Uh, hello, app. The YAML files, I didn't want to get into it. I'm basically driving everything from the command file, but eventually when you get into Kubernetes, you'll see these YAML files, yet another markup language. Uh, that defines everything in this deployment, for example, including like the rollout strategy, and here is the image that it's using, okay, V1. If I change this, to V2, okay? It, it's gonna accept the YAML file and, it, and the Kubernetes, the controller is gonna say, ho, oh, uh, I need Hello App V2. Where is Hello App V2? Pull it down and execute it. So if I save this, watch the right hand side. That wow, that's, that's what I wanted. That, that, wow, when I first saw this, I was like, man, this is black magic. This is amazing. You, you know what else is amazing? Is if I say kubectl rollout, undo, I made a mistake. And I do that. See hello v2? Look at that. No way. That is amazing. And if I, if I go back here and I say um, uh, replicas, let, let's, let's make them one. Boom. Now they're one. That is amazing. So that's cool, right? That is cool. Um, and there's so much other things that comes with uh, Kubernetes, uh, like, like setting rules, for example. If the CPU resources goes above 50%, automatically scale from 3 to up to a maximum of 10, and a whole bunch of cool things, right? You just need to get into it. But you can do it. Anyone can do this. Now, you may say, okay, read one, that's pretty cool. Uh, but show me like a real world example of like how this thing will actually work, okay? So I've got a little demo for you. Um, I've got here uh, 
a, a demo, and it's using Helm. Okay, Helm is a package manager. As you can imagine, if you've got pods that talk to other pods, you've got the front ends, the back ends, the middle tiers, and things like that, it, 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 you need a package manager that can package all of this stuff up so you execute one command, as we love to do, and poof, everything goes and it gets created, right? So Helm is something that you will eventually get into and start learning. And a Helm, uh, yeah, I've got a Helm uh, package, and it's, it installs uh, a AI um, uh, sort of demo. And what this thing does, if I execute it, it's just going to go and execute that chart, and it's going to install a whole bunch of stuff on my Kubernetes cluster. Okay? Uh, back end, front end, the, 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 the um, image recognizer. What this thing does is it's recognizing images that I've uploaded to the internet um, of me uh, on a holiday. Uh, sorry. Uh, which is pictures like on a blue balloon ride, for example, okay? And it's going to find faces using Google TensorFlow, okay? And uh, if I go here um, to FaceRec, it's actually put the URL, everything is, is there. And you can see what it's doing is it's starting to recognize faces in all of those images, okay? If I go back here and I go, the stuff that we've already learned, kubectl, get um, um, pods, you'll see that um, it's only running one pod for the recognizer, okay? And uh, which is this one here. This is one pod. If I say logs, you can see what it's doing. See, it's recognizing, it's putting boundary box, finding bo where, where are the eyes, where are the people, and things like that. And you'll notice here that its process rate, because I'm only running one pod, is about eight per second. Okay? Guess what we're going to do? <laughs> we're going to go back here, and we're going to say scale my deployment of the image recognizer to five. And guess what it does? It does what you say it does, supposed to do. And um, you'll eventually see this now taking effect. All right. So this is a real world example. Okay. I've got a lot of customers coming into my application. Now I need to process more, more of these images Maybe I'm face app or something like that, and, and I can now cope with the demand and the load. Okay? Of course, it eventually tears off because my storage isn't fast enough for Kubernetes. <laughs> um, but that's, that's a good, that's a good uh, problem to have. So let me wrap up. What have we done? We took my dev machine, which is out in the cloud, with Linux, and the Docker engine, and we've built a container that had the runtime of Python and the library Flask, and it, we called it Hello App V1. Then we created V2, and what we saw in V2 is it started to pull down the runtime and actually share that runtime across these two applications, okay, making it more efficient. We then took that application, we pushed it up in Docker Hub. You could have a private registry, it's fine but we just use Docker Hub as the registry, and we pulled that container into Kubernetes. We first ran one, contain, one pod, and we scaled to two pods, and we made it version two, and it did exactly what we expected it to do. It was almost like magic. We had like, wow, see ya, right? So the top scenarios for Kubernetes is, of course, you can lift and shift a whole bunch of containers to Kubernetes and, and have a lot of cost-saving, microservices, machine learning. We, show, we showed an example of that. And of course, IoT as well. You could run um, you know, the containers uh, you know, in, a, in, a, in a way either in the, in, the, in, the, in the cloud or on little edge devices um, as well. So with that, I think my time is up. It was an absolute pleasure to speak to you. I hope that you learned something and that you can maybe take this and say, hey, you know what, I can do that. Uh, and if you did say I can do that, all of this content is on my GitHub page. 
Um, so it's uh, a GitHub read one B, and, and uh, you can pull out all of the scripts and everything that I've, I've used, including the presentation. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I don't know if we have time for questions. Are you? Yeah. Question? Any questions? Yeah. It's more of a, a question about how did you find AKS uh, in terms of integrating with it? Oh, it it's um, without being too opinionated, but it, it's, it's very easy um, to, to use AKS. Uh, if you go onto my GitHub page, I, I've got a whole bunch of scripts to automatically, because what I do is I, I, I go around doing this and I need to deploy an AKS cluster like quickly and show someone something and to, to build the cluster and shut it down and tear it down, it's very, very simple. Uh, we've got some massive customers in South Africa using um, Kubernetes. Uh, one of the public case studies is, is, is uh, NetStar. The, the entire kind of IoT backend is actually running on Azure AKS. Are there any caveats that you would share with us and from your... Caveats? Uh, there's always caveats. <laughs> exactly. Um, but nothing that comes to <laughs> mind immediately. Ones, generally. <laughs> yeah, there's, al there's always uh, um, little fin finicky things. I think the, the biggest uh, blocker a lot of times is um, like what you do with storage in Kubernetes. Um, and, and I didn't touch on that at all, but storage is a massive topic. Uh, so you can chat to us about that. I think, uh, yeah. One more question, last question. Yeah. The face recognition apps. Oh, so I used, I built my, my own in Python. There's tons of them out on GitHub. Uh, but that uses uh, Google TensorFlow, and it uses um, Python pretty much. That's it. Uh, so it's nothing special. It's just the concept of it. Okay. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much, guys. Enjoy the rest of the conference.